uh, here at the Clinton School. My name is Skip Rutherford, the Dean of the School. Uh, and on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff, we're glad you're with us. May I ask that you uh, please uh, turn your cell phones, your Blackberries, um, and any other electronic devices off, and not to text message uh, Hunter during the, uh, these presentations. Thank you, and I believe you have on your sheet, uh, on your table, the upcoming programs. My friend Mark Malcolm was appointed as coroner of Pulaski County in 1995 and serves as the only full-time coroner in the state of Arkansas. He also serves as an instructor for the University of Arkansas Criminal Justice Institute, UALR, and UAMS. In June of 2007, he was appointed to the FEMA National Advisory Committee. This council was created by Congress to provide service and guidance to the FEMA administration on all aspects of preparedness and emergency management. Additionally, Mark serves as Director of Mass Fatality Response for the Arkansas Department of Health. He served as Director of Field Operations for Kenyan International Emergency Services during the search and recovery of those who died following Hurricane Katrina. And he also served as Director of Morgue Operations in Thailand following the December 2004 tsunami. During his 20 years in law enforcement, he has been involved in over 40,000 death investigations. So today, from what's happening on the streets of Little Rock in terms of crime, to what would happen if the New Madrid earthquake hit today, or we had a pandemic of avian flu, Mark is the one in the know. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Malcolm. Thank you, Skip. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I, it is, uh, yeah, I, I'm grateful for the invitation. I will tell you, as someone who has spent my entire adult life in public service, it means a lot to be invited to come to the Clinton School and, and talk today. I will tell you this. I hope nobody minds, but I'm taking my coat off. Right? Listen, I, I can throw a tie on with the rest of them, but I'm not going to stand around with that. And I turned my phone off, which I can't, I don't think in 21, or since they invented cell phones, since Altel handed me my first cell phone, I don't think I've ever had one turned off, but I just shut it off. So we'll see how that goes. I might have to slip over there in a minute and check it. <laughs> I, uh, I, as I kind of thought about what we would talk about today, one of the things that, I, that is important, I think, is that, in, especially in disaster management, I, I think that, that there, are, there are kind of three worlds or three generations of disaster management and emergency planning in uh, in this country, and one is the one is the pre-9/11 disaster management world, where we primarily what we did in in pre-9/11 is we planned for natural disasters. We planned for hurricanes and floods and tornadoes and ice storms and thing and 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 a little bit of earthquake planning along the way here in Arkansas and and in Pulaski County. We always because we have an airport here, we always had a, a plan of what we would do if a commercial airliner crashed and and. Um, or, or a corporate jet. We've had all that. We've had the American Airlines crash, and, and we've had several corporate jet crashes that, that occurred. But it was really primarily natural disaster planning was really the pre-9-11 um, world of disaster planning. And then 9-11 in, and then came, and, and after that, really what we, what we had was the, in the post 9-11 world was it was all about terrorism and bioterrorism became the catchword. We all had, to, you know, one of the things we had to start doing was we had to start identifying our targets all of a sudden, which was something that we really had never done pre 9-11. We, we had to identify targets. We knew that, you know, nuclear one was always in Russellville, but now it was a target. And the Pine Bluff Arsenal is a target. And the National Center for Toxicological Research is a target. You know, a presidential library is a target. And so post 9-11, I think we had to start to begin to identify our targets. And then it became about nuclear and biological and chemical weapons. And there was anthrax and smallpox. There were all the things that we had to, that we had to know about and plan for in, in, um, in disaster management and disaster planning. And, and we did that, you know, and that's where, that's really where the money went to and where, um, 
as we as we moved along and, and everybody began to study that was still with kind of in the, you know everybody knew that in the back of our mind we still had to be prepared for for the natural disasters but primarily it was all about terrorism and bioterrorism and <clears throat> and planning for that and can you can you decontaminate your patients and your and your employees and and working with the hospitals and the and uh, the emergency room and, and emergency medical people to prepare them for that type of thing and then as we went along with that and that was all rocking along pretty good and then we had Katrina and I think now and where we are in emergency management planning in, in the United States especially is post Katrina planning and I, and I think what what when I say post Katrina planning what I mean is nobody wants to be the next Ray Nagin and nobody wants to be the next Michael Brown and nobody wants to be the next guy on TV being told he's doing a great job and getting fired the next day that's that's where we are now I and mean, really and truly what Katrina and you know if, if and there has to be something good come out of everything bad and I think that if anything good came out of the debacle that was the response to Katrina it is that nobody wants to be that guy again and so what we what we do now is now the catchphrase is all hazards now it's everybody plans it's an all hazard plan is the is the catchphrase and that's what we all work toward now is to be ready for anything and I think especially in Pulaski County I mean, you know one of the things that we've tried to do at least in the coroner's office in my 20 years is to is to be prepared practically for anything I mean I obviously you can't I mean nobody was prepared for 9-11 to occur but I think today I think today if you know if if a plane were to fly into the Metropolitan Bank building today we've got a plan for that you know, did we have a plan for that on September 11, 2001? Probably not, but we do now, and and you know we we know we know what to do, and I and I think one of the other parts about that is that just by virtue of the amount of time and experience and 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 effort that we've put into mass fatality response around the world, it through through my office and and helping people in their in, in their time of need, it, it helps to build it helps to build our program. We know more about we know more about the things that we don't want to do wrong. We know more about the things that, that we want to do more of. And, and, and so I think that that, that helps. And one, and, and one of the things now in this, in this post-Katrina world of planning that, that I think is important for us to know is, is a good definition of mass fatality incident. Because one of the things that, that we've never had in Arkansas is a mass fatality response plan. And, you know, if a, if a plane goes down on Dixon Street leaving out of the Northwest Arkansas Airport on a Saturday afternoon that happens to be a Razorback game day, you know, that is, listen, there's, there's been no plan on how to respond to that. And, you know, who, the, and, and part of the problem is, you know, there's 75 different coroners in Arkansas. I'm the only one who's full-time. I'm the only one with a full-time staff. I'm the only one with a full-time, real full-time budget. I mean, if you take the, the budget of the coroner's offices in that, that utilize the say the four other largest cities in Arkansas, their budget probably combined doesn't equal mine. And so, I, you know, I, we were probably the default plan for everybody. I think I think what would you know if it happened somewhere, they would probably call us and ask how to deal with it. But there's never been really an official thing. And 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 so one of the things that that we've started to try to work on over the last few months is is work with the Arkansas Department of Health, which I'll tell you a little bit about later to develop a real mass fatality plan for the state of Arkansas for the first time. But, you know, in, in the post-Katrina world, I think one of the things that we want to talk about is what is a mass fatality incident and what is a true mass fatality incident. And, and you know, it can, be, it can be anything, really. I mean, when you talk about mass fatalities, people talk about, about thousands or, or, you know, hundreds. And really, a mass fatality incident is anything that overwhelms the day-to-day -day operation of your agency. And, and let me tell you something, that around this state, that could be 10. I mean, there are, you know, there are places in Arkansas where that could be 10, that could be 12, and, and only because the local coroner is responsible for that, for that response. The coroner's office investigates death, and they're responsible for, for recovering those bodies and identifying those bodies. And so what you really have to do, and one of the things that, that as, I, as I've gone around the last year or so and, and, and speaking about mass fatality in, in different parts of Arkansas, the Criminal Justice uh, Institute has implemented kind of a, in, their, in their recovery of human remains class, we've started to do mass fatality uh, a little bit, address that. And one of the things we talk about is knowing your number, because you know what you've got to do, you've got to know when to reach out and ask for help. And really and truly, in a mass fatality incident in Arkansas, there are places that are going to have to reach out for help pretty quickly. And, and know that six or seven is um, is 
their number. And you know what? And let me tell you something about that is that this is... This, it, it, this is just the truth, and I'll just put it this way. This is the plainest way I know how to do it. Any jackass can put a body in the back of a pickup truck, but that's not mass fatality response. You know what I'm saying? That's not, I mean, anybody can do that. Listen, when we went to Thailand to do the, to do the recovery in, 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 following the tsunami, the Royal Thai police did just that. They just they went around, they just snatched people, and they threw them in the back of trucks. They took them to Buddhist temples, and they laid out dry ice which was all fine and good. The problem with that was nobody knew where they came from and nobody knew what they were close to and there was no documentation or, or any of that. And so identifying those people becomes next to impossible. Even though over a period of time it was done, it becomes nearly impossible if there's no proper training and if people who are out in the field who are doing that don't know how to do it. And let me tell you something, if you've never done it, it's all, it, you don't want to be the guy that has to step out untrained, un, unknown with no eye for that and do it. And so... So we, we try to talk about knowing your number, and, 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 and I think as, we, as we've done that, and over the last several months as we've started to build that, I think that we're in a much better, I think we're in a much better position. I mean, overall, I guess, you know, we go to all these meetings, and I just, I'm, I'm not a meeting kind of guy, I can't stand to sit in a room for, for hours on end and talk about stuff, it just drives me crazy, but I just don't. Uh, but, but one of the things that I've, that I've noticed is as we've gone around the state and doing these disaster management plans and meetings, especially with earthquake, you know, I, the, uh, the earthquake probably, I mean, I think, is is the single largest looming thing out there for, for Arkansas. Is, is, you know, I mean, the, the flu pandemic, it, it, we talk about that and we plan for that, but I really think the earthquake is probably the bigger deal to be ready for. And I, I will tell you that I, I have seen a lot of planning in, going into the earth. You know, there's another meeting next week. We were in one a couple of weeks ago in Conway. And, and the Department of Emergency Management is, is working with a group, the Central United States Earthquake Consortium, to to help begin to build those plans and for people to know what to do. And in the northeast part of the state, especially around Blyville, and, you know, Blyville, Mark Tree, those people will be incredibly affected if the New Madrid zone does quake or when it quakes. So I don't think it's a matter of if, I think it's a matter of when. And, and, and they're working as hard as they know how and, and, and within their limits, whether it's funding or people or personnel, and to, to prepare themselves for, for that. So, I mean, I think that we're, I think we're probably a lot better off than a lot of people think we are. You know, um, we went to, went to Thailand in, in December of 2004 to, uh, to help with the tsunami effort. I actually went over there at the request of the Australian government. When the tsunami happened, the Australians kind of responded for the Thai government. They kind of became the supreme allied commander, and, and the Australians were kind of in charge. And, and, um, and really, that's kind of... That's kind of what we saw when we arrived. It's just a beachfront resort. You know, the tsunami was like a 50-foot wall of water that came in, knocked everything down and left, and about 10 minutes later, another 50-foot wall of water came in, knocked everything that was left down, and, and went on back out into the, into the ocean. Our, our primary responsibility was to build a morgue facility, and, and which we did. We constructed that and uh, took, got the land from the ties, constructed the morgue facility, and um, brought in supplies and refrigeration and and people from all around the world to work for us in these uh, in these in this little facility. We had three morgue sites in Thailand. We went on the north part of the north part of the island um, of, the, of the country in Khao Lok. We had one at Phuket, which is our main one, and then one in a little town called Krabi. But the, the Phuket morgue was the was the repatriation center. One of the things that one of the things that I didn't know about about Thailand is people from Europe go to Thailand for vacation like we go to Destin. I mean, they, they, char they, they, they charter planes, you know, an entire plane from like Sweden will go and they'll all spend a Christmas holiday in Thailand, which, which struck me as odd, but that's what they do. And so, so we, had, we had not only as when we tried to collect anti-mortem or pre-death information, we had to deal with who you asked for that information because you'd have a mother and a, you know, a husband and a wife and their kids and two sets of grandparents and an aunt and an uncle and three or four cousins, an entire family who came down together to stay at some resort together, and they all got wiped out together. And so which made, which logistically made for, made for some difficulties. But there were 122 different countries that lost people. So at the Repatriation Center, one of the things that we were responsible for is when an ID was made and contact with the family was made, then we made the flight arrangements and, and had an embalming corps, a funeral director corps there that prepared the body, got it ready to go on the airplane. We transported it to the, to the airport. We made sure it was in the belly of the plane. Then we had somebody meet that plane at the, 
at the home of origin, and they escorted that body to the funeral home for the for the family. So repatriation was a was a huge part of what we did in in Thailand. Um, just some of our refrigeration. What bodies would be collected? They were brought into the refrigeration site. They're cataloged. They're numbered, and then they would go for autopsy so that they had their DNA and their and their um, and if you know their their dental work or whatever we were going to do as far as as the autopsy to to, to put them into a data entry system and some of you may have seen these on TV this is uh, these are the missing person photos and the, the walls would just stretch for you know for hundreds of yards and one of the one of the things that happened in the beginning before before there was any type of organized response was that the Thai, the Thai police would go out and they would take Polaroids of people in whatever condition they were in two or three days even after the event and they'd post them, and you had people trying to identify, visually identify decomposed pictures, which, you know, which doesn't work, and obviously we wouldn't allow it here, but, but it was because, you know, they, nobody ever done that over there before. They'd never had to deal with that before, and, and, and which, is one of the, which is one of the huge lessons that, that, that I think this country had to learn during Katrina, is that if you haven't done it before and you haven't gotten yourself ready for it, you need to find somebody who has done it before and ask for that person's help. I mean, I, you know, one of the and, and one of the, one of the biggest things about Katrina to me was that you know we were we were on Friday night before the hurricane hits. If the storm on your television on the right hand side of Florida is bigger than the Gulf of Mexico, and somebody says, "Boy, this is a really big storm and it's moving right," you should probably start to get yourself ready. It just as a just as a as a hint. I mean, you got to think about that. I mean, I'm laying in bed on Friday before the thing hit. I knew it was going to hit. I'm not, you know, I knew it was clear. And when, and you know, that's why they do the tracking of the storm for you to tell you that it's coming. That's why everybody on TV does that. All the meteorologists have their little tracking thing. And now we have the cone of uncertainty, and and so we all follow the cone, and we all kind of know where the storm's going to go. Well, if it's here and it's bigger than you are, and you've got three or four days, now's a good time to start. Now's a good time to start thinking about that. Not when it's here and you know somebody has to tell your leaders to get those people out that that was the and to even to this I mean, I'm telling you to this day there are, there are things about the Katrina response that floor me that absolutely floor me and one of them is how you see a storm that big coming and don't do anything about it until it's too late and and, and how you how you don't respond I mean how you don't how you don't get ready and how you don't reach out and ask for help. And, and the truth of the matter is, I mean, we were, the, you know, the, the hurricane came and the next day I was, I went to Baton Rouge. I was asked to go to Baton Rouge and begin the, the more support operation there. And, and there was nobody there who knew what we were supposed, we were told by FEMA Washington to go there and we got there and there was nobody there to tell us, okay, we're, we're here, we have, Semi truck loads of equipment. Where do you want us? Well, nobody knew. Well, how can that happen? How does that, How do you not know? You asked me to come. How do you not know? And and one of the other things that was so strange to me was, you know, it, 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 which was huge. And I and you know, I got appointed to this FEMA National Advisory Council, and I can tell you, about three days of me in October will be enough for them. I, I probably won't be reappointed. And one of because one one of the things that is odd to me is how come. Because here's the here was the deal. We get there, we get our stuff, and I go and I, I'm trying to find my FEMA contact, a guy that a guy to this day that I've never met, and and so I'm on the phone. And of course, you know, only some of the phones work down there. And I'm dialing the guy's number, and I get a voicemail, and then I, so then I find somebody with FEMA Louisiana who tells me, well, all of these people and all of your equipment is supposed to be in Alexandria at Camp Beauregard, National Guard camp, a couple hours west, and I said, you know, that can't be right because the hurricane hit. An hour that way. No, truly, we're going to stage at Beauregard. So I, this is what we do. We grab all our stuff, we go up there. And we get up to Camp Beauregard, and I swear to you, a guy says, well, you all are supposed to be in, it just, it'll, it's in St. Gabriel's, just south of Baton Rouge. Said, no, 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 the FEMA guy and the FEMA Louisiana guy in Baton Rouge said I'm supposed to come up here. And he says to me, well, we are FEMA Washington. We are not FEMA Louisiana. And I'm like, dude, you're FEMA. You know? <laughs> FEMA ought to be FEMA. And let me tell you something, it didn't work that way. <laughs> Listen, it didn't work that way. And, and it, it, it just didn't. And, and so, yeah, so we're going, you know, I mean, I am literally walking trailer to tra command center to command center with, and, and asking people, okay, look, 
this is the morgue. This is, this is the morgue for the opera. Where is it supposed to be? Man, I don't know. You're going to have to ask this guy. So then I found the Corps of Engineers. You know, it's a red shirt. Everybody, the Corps of Engineers guys wearing their little red shirt, little Corps of Engineers thing here. And, and I'm like, listen, you've got to help me. He said, hey, that's a FEMA responsibility. <laughs> and, I, you know, and, of course, all I can think to say is, oh, that's right, you guys are the ones that built those levees. I'll find somebody from FEMA. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, I just, you know, you, 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 some days you reach a point where, you know, and, and the... The th and the thing about that was, is, is that, you know, if you think about it, I mean, it, to, to think about it, it's, it is comical. I mean, it was just, it is, it is, a, it is, it is a, it is a tragic comedy of, of errors that, that occurred during that time. And if you think about it, the whole time that I'm doing this and I'm wandering around the Louisiana countryside, because this, let me tell you what my wife said. My wife accused me of going down there trying to eat and check into hotels. Because that was, because every time I talked to her on the cell phone, she said, where are you? So, well, I'm going to stop in and get me a little something to eat and then I've got to find a place to stay tonight. Um, and so I got accused of going to New Orleans to do nothing but check into hotels and eat, eat meals. And, and, but as you, you know, if you think about it, we're wandering around the Louisiana countryside with a bunch of equipment that my government asked me to take down there. And water's pouring through the levees. And there are people on TV strapped, who are dead, strapped to stop signs and strapped to, to, to guardrails and things of that nature. And, and, and no, but nothing's being done about it. And I, I will tell you, this is the truth, and I honestly believe this. this is, let me get back. I honest to God believe this, that had the United States military not been sent down there along with private vendor people, it'd still be the way it was. It'd still, there'd still be dead people down there if private vendors had not been asked to go down there with military assistance and clean that up. And that's the truth. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd lived that dream for a long time down there, and I can tell you that that is a God's honest truth. That, and, and it should never be that way. It should not be that way. You know, the... Uh, and, and, it's, and, and the whole thing down there was, it's a, was, a, was a combination of, of city and state and federal government not, not cooperating with each other, not planning for anything, believing they could weather any storm that came their way. And when they couldn't, then what do you do? And, and until the, I mean, really and truly, until the governor decided to, until the governor decided to hire that done, it was not going to get done. And, and, you know, and I'll tell you something else about that. You know, it wasn't but a, a week or so later when Michael Chertoff was sitting before Congress and his words were, when criticized about body recovery, his exact words were, we are not in the body recovery business. And that was part of his testimony. And you know what? That's fine. If, they, if you're not in the body recovery business, that's fine. The problem with that is that should have been a shot heard around the world for every governor, every mayor, every county chief executive in this country when the director of Homeland Security, who, head, who, who, run, who runs FEMA, says we are not in the body recovery business, which what that says to me, if I'm a, if I'm a leader of, of a government in, in, my, in this country, is I got to get my own plan and they're not coming. You know, when it gets declared an emergency and there's federal money that needs to be reimbursed, they're going to help me with that federal money, but they're not coming to help me clean up my mess. I mean, I think that's what that means and, and, and that what that should have been. And even though it probably wasn't, it should have been the shot heard around the country when it comes to disaster management. What that means is, listen, we're tickled for you. We're sorry, but you better clean up that part of that mess all by yourself. Because I will tell you that historically, nobody cares about the dead people in disasters. Historically, nobody does. Because, and, and, and there, I mean, there are legitimate reasons for that. There is because, you know, the emergency medical response is for the people that are injured and living and have a chance to live. Well, yeah, I understand that. You know, that's part of the triage. You don't mind. The dead people are the black tag. They're not going anywhere. They're not bothering anybody. They're done. You can't, you can't save them. You can't, you didn't, you know, you didn't cause it. You can't control it. You sure can't cure it. So you move on to one you can help. And I understand that part. But then there comes a part, there comes a point in time during that that somebody's got to deal with that. Somebody has to deal with the dead people. And, and so, so these are kind of some of the things that we've been, that we've been talking about around in, in the state over the last several months is, is as we develop a plan and, and what and, it, and the whole the whole thing kind of bore out of pandemic flu planning the health department the director of the health department and his preparedness group came to me back I guess in December right around the first of the year and said one of the things that happened to flu pandemic is that Arkansas had been found not sufficient by the CDC several times for a lack of a mass fatality response capability and how we would handle that. And so they asked me to help them begin that. Some of the things that, that, we, that you have to do, I mean, you know, is before, before, the, uh, bef before the plan, as you get ready to develop your plan, is you kind of, kind of not, as you're developing the plan, you've got to uh, assess who's responsible for what. I mean, you really, in, and decide in advance what everybody's going to do, what everybody's part, what part everybody's going to play in that, and, and begin to train and, and 
in those responsibilities. Not, you know, I mean, cause, and let me tell you something in, in, that I don't ever worry. There's two things in emergency management that I don't ever worry about. I don't ever worry about the police and the fire and the ambulance people. Because let me tell you what they're going to do. When the horn blows, they're going. That's what they do. If they don't care what the emergency is, they're going. When the horn sounds, the fire and the police and the, and the, and the ambulance people, they're on the horse. You know, they're, they're in the game. And they'll adapt to that game as they need to. And the other thing I don't worry about is, is the power grid. And, I'm, and I'll tell you why. It is because as long as a community is not sucking electricity off the power grid, energy ain't making any money. And that, that's true. Now listen, listen, I, they, we all have to have power. I mean, you know what? My refrigerated containers run off of electricity when, if we activate a mass fatality response plan. Or they run off of diesel gas, which means somebody's got to run a pipeline of gasoline somewhere to a truck to get that truck, to, that diesel to me to run my generators. But listen, it, one, of the, one of the beauties of a public-private partnership in disaster management is the private part of that partnership is not making money if they are not supplying what you ask them for. And if, if you know, the, the power grid people, the people that's, you know, center point and, and energy, they're, they have to get, that's their business, what they do for a living, they have to get back online. And, and they, they have to do it because the community has to have it, they have to have it because those of us who are responding and, and working and trying to help those people have to have it, and they have to have it because they gotta make a living. And, and that's the truth. I don't, I, don't, I, would, I don't ever sweat the power grid, and I don't, and I don't sweat the emergency part of it because, because they're going to go. They're gonna, the, when the horn sounds, they're coming. And, and that's, just, that's, just the natural, that's just the natural truth of it. So, and so, so during, the, during a disaster, these are the things that we want to look for. We want, you know, one of the things in mass fatality planning is, you know, I told you anybody can put a body in the back of a pickup truck. But what you have to, one of the things that, I, one of the big things that gets lost in the whole mass fatality thing and a lot of times is that people, you know, if there's a hundred dead or a thousand dead, it doesn't matter, is that people believe that that is, that it, that is one, that is a thousand people dead in one incident. And you can't approach it that way. If you approach it that way, you'll, you'll screw it up. You'll screw it up from the very first body you pick up. What you have, the way you have to approach that is that that is a thousand different death investigations. Each one of those deaths is an individual, singular death investigation. And it, now it all happened to be caused by this one incident, but it's a thousand different death investigations or a hundred or whatever the number happens to be different death investigations because every one of them has to be located. Every one of them has to be documented. Every one of them has to be recovered. There has to be an examination. There has to be an identification of every one of them. Then you've got to find the family. Then that body has to be disposed of or repatriated to some other part of the country or the world. And, and unless you approach mass fatality from that angle, body number 0001 is the only one you're going to get right. I, can, I know. I can tell you. And, and personal effects inventory and recovery is huge because let me tell you what happens when you, when you, when you can't reassociate a $12 Casio watch to, from this corner of the street to this guy, it becomes a $25,000 Rolex is what it becomes if there's not appropriate. It just does, man. Listen, that's the nature of the game. And, you know, so personal effects inventory and tracking is just as important. And, and the way to, get, to keep a handle on that is to handle it as though they each and every one are individual and singular death investigations. And that way you don't ever mess it up uh, because, you just, you know, you're working one at a time. I mean, you have different crews that are doing it for you, but if everybody has the same mindset, then you can't mess it up. Crisis communication is huge. Um, you know, because what you don't want to be is you don't want to be the guy that notifies the wrong family. You don't need your you don't need a a mayor or a governor giving figures that are different from a county chief executive or from a coroner or something. You don't you know you don't you don't want that. You have to build crisis communication into it. And I tell you the other thing that that is incredibly important, probably one of the most important aspects of any disaster is is call centers, the one eight hundred help number, because you know if I'm in if I'm in Seattle, Washington, and I find out that there's been an earthquake and, and a family member of mine was in the Hampton Inn on Stadium, Boule Stadium Boulevard in Jonesboro, who do I call? Who do I call to find out about that? Well, you have to have a 1-800 call center. You've got to have 1-800 earthquake. And you, then you call, and, and those people have to be skilled in taking those calls and say, you know, all right, yes, that's correct. Earthquake occurred. Who, you know, who is it you're looking for? How old are they? What's their date of birth? How tall are they? All that anti-mortem information. You know, who's their dentist? Those are hard questions to ask somebody who on the other end of the phone is frantic and probably screaming at you. But you have to be, you have to be skilled in taking those calls. Call centers are huge. 
and, and call centers can call centers can also are, are where all the anti-mortem information begins, and so you have to have them. And the other thing you have to have is you have to have grief counsel, not only for the people that are coming into town looking for their people, but for your own team. I mean, you cannot ask a person. Let me tell you what you can't do. You can't ask a person to spend to spend 12, 15 hours a day, every day of the week, chest deep in decomposition and every septic tank for 300 miles and, and a crude oil spill and whatever other nastiness is in that water. And, and it's just expect that they'll go on and on and on and on and on and on without stopping. You've got to, you've got to provide some type of debrief for those people every once in a while. You've got to ask them, hey, are, how are you? Are you doing okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Are you sure? What did you do today? What did you see today? And, you know, and it's not one of those deals where you sit down and you say, well, now, how does that affect you? How do you feel about it? That's not what I'm, I'm just talking about general conversation so that, so that they have an opportunity to, de to debrief. And if you, if you have somebody who is personally affected by something, you've got to find that out now so that you can pull them out of that situation, assign them to something else for a while so that that doesn't affect them. You know, I, I, in my own office here, in, we, we hired a guy who worked three weeks. We had a six-year-old drown in a swimming pool. The next day, he's in my office. I can't do this. And that's fine. I respect that. I got no problem with that. Not everybody on the face of the earth is cut out to be chest deep in decomposition. You're just not. And, and so, but you've got to have that. And if you have counseling in, built into your plan as you go along, you'll be okay. The, the counseling continues after the disaster and, and the return of when we reassociate to personal effects. And in some cases... Memorial services, are, I think, are appropriate. I think memorial services need to be built into a plan because people will want to, people will want to remember that. People will want to go back to the site. One of the things we did in Thailand is the big, long white wall that you saw there in one of those pictures was a wall of remembrance that the Thai government asked us to build. Every country that lost a citizen had a, had a, had a flag, had the name of the country. People would come in. One of the things that the wall of remembrance was good for was that families who were awaiting identification news, who had brought anti-mortem stuff, who brought dental records, who brought x-rays, or, you know, brought whatever they brought to help us identify, that that was a place for them to go so that they weren't milling about around, so that they weren't having to go into the victim identification center and asking questions all day. They had a central place where they could go, where they felt close. At least they felt part of the response. They felt as though they were doing something. They were providing some information. They would put pictures up on the wall um, or notes and flowers and candles and, and, and that kind of stuff. So that, that's all good. So, so we've done all that. You know, and that's, so we've been talking about all that. And, and, and what, what has borne out of that work over the last six or seven months is this. It's the first ever mass fatality response plan in the 171-year history of the state of Arkansas. And it is, it's the Arkansas Rapid Mortuary Response Plan. And basically what that is is a plan that can be activated by the director of the health department any time or at the request of the Arkansas Department of Emergency Management. They can ask the health department director to activate that plan. And what, we, and what that is is, and there is, a, is a plan that moves people and it moves refrigeration and it moves um, supplies. It moves personal protective equipment and body bags, you know, gloves, masks, suits, all that kind of stuff into whatever part of the state of Arkansas is, is hit by whatever type of disaster it is an all hazards plan. Um, the, beauty of the, the beauty of this is that it's a public-private partnership. There's a private vendor component to this plan, which allows us to bring in. One of, the, one of the parts about private vendor is that you can bring in people who are already trained in personal effects inventory, who are already trained in body inventory. Um, and because let me tell you, here's one of the things. Let's say we go to, it doesn't matter, you know, pick a county. Let's say we go to Stone County. We go to Mountain View one day for something. There are not enough police officers and sheriff's deputies in, in Stone County and in Mountain View to handle, to, to handle whatever the disaster happens to be anyway. So what you do is in, in, the, in, the, in the mortuary response plan, you build in a security detail that you can bring in to secure your own facilities. Because what you can't ask is you can't ask the state police and the local authorities up there to secure all of my people and all of my equipment because they have to be out secure in neighborhoods and they're going to be part of the search and re rescue and they're going to be part of perimeter security and blocking off streets and moving traffic and all that. So if it's needed, we build a contingency, and one of, and which one of those things that I call community support contingencies. You can build in your own security to the plan. If you need it, then you have it. If you don't need it, you don't have to bring it. But at least you know that it's there and it's available, and you build people into a plan that, are, that already know, already know the database and already know what to do when the body comes to a morgue site, already know what you're looking for in personal effects, how to 
how to recover them, identify them, clean them, match them to people, and then return them to families. And and the reason that you do another reason that you do that and you bring people in who are already trained to do that is what you don't want is you don't need a well-meaning volunteer from a local church sitting next to a volunteer fireman who's off duty for the first time in 19 hours sitting at your computer logging in dead people because they won't want to do it the way that it needs to be they'll do it they'll do it the best they know how to do it but it won't be the way that it needs to be done so that it is exactly the same as the next shift which would be two volunteers who've never done it before or two people who have done it a million times and, that, and, and, and are trained in how to do it. And that's the beauty, of, that's the beauty of, of this plan is that we utilize already trained personnel. It does victim recovery in communities that need help going out and doing those recoveries. Um, identification, there are forensic pathologists, odontologists, DNA people to assist the state medical examiner. You know, one of the things that I mean, we have a state medical examiner here who just like my, you know, we do 3,300 death investigations a year in the coroner's office in Pulaski County alone. So, when, and about three or 400 of those we send to him for autopsy. Well, if I'm sending two a day out there for autopsy and other 74 counties are sending one or two a day in here, how quickly do you think that he is going to meet the definition of a mass fatality incident, which is anything that overwhelms a day-to-day -day operation of your office? Pretty quick, pretty quickly, I will tell you. And so we've built in the recovery, inventory, and identification of those remains. One of the other things that we can do in the community support contingency is if we need to, the same thing we did in Thailand, bring in funeral industry people to help the local funeral directors who are not going to have enough embalmers, who are not going to have enough funeral directors to deal with families and do that. We, bring, we can bring in those people in a support role to help the local people and, and, to, and, and keep up with their keep up with their business. So it, this is the first time, today is the first day we've ever publicly talked about the, the, the Arkansas Rapid Mortuary Response Team. And so, so it, it's an excellent plan. One of the things that we'll start doing now, I guess right after the first of the year, is to start going around the state and training, um, training local responders on what it is, making them aware of it, how we're going to interact with them, what do they need from us. One of the things about doing that, one of the things, you know, the plan is always the same. The, plan's never, the plan never changes, but you do have to adapt your plan to the personality of your disaster because every disaster has a personality and, and you have to adapt to that. And so one of the things that we'll learn from them over the next several months is exactly, you know, what is it that you're capable of doing, what can you not do, and what do you need us to do for you, which I think will, which we'll, we'll start to learn a little bit about that on our own. Um, it also deals with surge capacity for the hospitals. The hospital association um, in Arkansas has been a big part of contributing information to this because we'll be responsible, especially like in flu pandemic or during the earthquake, if you have to evacuate people who have survived you know, there to other hospitals, there's going to be a need for surge capacity. People are going to die. When they get transported, they're not going to survive that, some of them. And so we'll, we'll be able to move into areas and provide surge capacity for the hospitals, which is just another part of the community support contingency. So there you go. Those are my kids. Listen, that, that's Cafe, that is the grand reopening of Cafe Dumont in New Orleans. I'd been, we'd been down there, you know, since the storm came, and I had not seen my kids. I did one thing when I, I've got one, my youngest, whose birthday is the 21st day of September. As soon as we finished that day, on the 20th down there, I got in the car, and I got out of town, I drove up. So I got here during, in the middle of the night. I was here when she woke up for, happy birthday, daddy loves you, gotta go. And <laughs> so, you know, I was, hey, happy birthday, here's your little token of love, and I'm out of here. And, but then they had a little fall break from school, so we, they were, listen, they were the only, they were the only people under the age of like 35 in all of New Orleans and everybody, but they, but they had their beignets and their lattes and all that one morning, and so and they still talk about, I wanna go back to that cafe where they had the beignets, daddy. So it was pretty good. Any questions about any of that that we covered? I went through that pretty quick. Yeah. Go ahead. Tim Jatina, I'm a student from class three. And I would say, ask you at this point, how would you rate the improvement of our first responder and our emergency management systems and what still needs to be done? Here in Arkansas? Here in Arkansas just, and federal. Yeah. I, well, I think, I think here, I think we're in good shape here in Arkansas. I really do. I mean, I, I, let me tell you what you have. If nothing else, what you have is you have a lot of people who it, who it really means a lot to, to be prepared for their community. It really means a lot for them to serve their communities and to be as prepared as they possibly can. You know, are we as prepared as we ought to be in a lot of communities? Probably not. I mean, there, and there's reasons for that. Resources, a number of people who are available to them, and there's all kinds of reasons. But I think all in all, and, and it, I mean, I think we're in pretty good shape. I mean, you know, if the, when the earthquake comes, there are, are you know, 
there are going to be aspects of that that don't go right. I mean, that's the very nature of a disaster. I'll just tell you the truth, the very nature of a disaster. Some things get screwed up along the way, and you adapt to that. You know, that's the old adapt, improvise, and overcome. But I think all in all, I think Arkansas is in a, in a pretty good condition. I think we're in a better shape now than we were pre-Katrina, and a lot of that has to do with post-Katrina attitude toward planning. And I, I think one of the other things nationally that you saw post-Katrina planning is Hurricane Dean a couple of weeks ago. Pre-Katrina, you would never have seen that amount of buildup to get ready for a storm that you saw. I mean, you know, the federal government was all over that. The federal government was not going to mess up Dean if Dean came on shore. And, but prior to, you know, had Katrina not happened, you would never have seen that huge buildup, that huge run, that all, over, all over the news talking about how we're going to spend all this money in advance and it's always better to be safe than sorry, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I, you know, all in all, I, I think, that especially from a federal government standpoint, I think they've learned They've learned their lesson, and they're trying to learn from it. Would you, in your own opinion, give us an idea of what you think the differences are in, emotionally for the public in a natural disaster and one that's caused by either military or terrorist sure. actions? I, I think I think a lot of it. Yeah, differs. a lot of it has to do with. I think a lot of it has to do with the initial knowledge that it's not a natural disaster, that, it is, that it's an attack at some point. I mean, I think, you know, during 9-11, I think that was the hardest part to get past was we, this, somebody did this to us, purposefully did this to us. And, and I think the response, I think the response from people in emergency management is the same. I mean, I, you know, I think that I, and now how they interact with the community is probably different because everybody in, in, in that situation, you're far more on edge. The community is far more on edge. In a natural disaster, there's the initial shock of what happened, but then everybody knows, well, you know, we got to kind of, we all, you know, everybody's got to kind of step up and get past that. And I think even after, even, you know, after 9-11, there, there was a time period in there where, you know, you just said there were some people who thought, you know what, we might not get past it. You know, we're not going to get past it. We don't, nobody's really ready to step up. But I, I think in the, in the emergency management community, there's always going to be, there's always somebody who's, who's ready to, to respond, you know, when the horn blows. And, but I think, I think from a public perception, I think that's the difference is it just it takes longer to get past that. And, you know, will it take longer to get over it if it happens again? I don't know. You know, but that first time, the, 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 that day, it was the, the shock of somebody did this to us, did it on purpose, and now what do we do? You know, I think, so I think that's probably the, the biggest difference. Mark, question. What if, you know, hypothetical, I know you've studied these disasters. You know, we keep hearing about the earthquake, the New Madrid earthquake. We saw what it did in 1811, 1812. What would happen? What, I mean, hypothetically, I know we can't predict it, but again, we had an earthquake of that magnitude. We sort of roughly know where the fault is. We roughly know what, what, what do you, I mean, just hypothetically, Jonesboro, Blyville, Memphis, what, what do you see? Well, I mean, I think that obviously the first thing that's going to happen is like we talked about, I mean, the, the fire and the, the first responders, your fire police and your EMS people are going to be there. They're going to do, you know, they are not going to have all of the roads available to them. I mean, I think that I think we understand that, that that there are going to be roads that are not passable. So there's got to be there's got to be plan to to get around that. I mean, there's got to, you know there's going to be a lot of imp improvisation during that. Do you do you borrow a guy's do you borrow a guy's tractor in order to get to the other side of a of a riverbed? Do you you know how do you how do you do it? But the, the fire, the first responder, the police people, they're going to do what they know how to do. And then I think that that what follows that is. The hospitals will implement their plans. The hospitals know what they want to do and what they need to do, and and will begin to begin to move patients as they can best move them and how they think they should move them. And and I think shortly after that, you've got Department of Emergency Management that's going to have to move into that area. And I, and obviously, we're going to go from a health department standpoint to begin our our mass fatality response because if an earthquake of that magnitude comes, there's definitely going to be fatalities. And, but, you know, it, it's one of those things where you, you don't know what the response is going to be until you actually do it. I mean, truly, you just don't. But I think that with all of the earthquake discussion that we've had over the last couple of years, I mean, I, and, and especially these last few months, I, I think that at least you're developing a sense of what you ought to do. I mean, there's not going to be a book where everybody turns to page three and says, oh, this is what we're supposed to do now. But I think that with each, each time that we talk about it, each time that, 
that emergency management goes into those communities and has the local talks and, and they've got area coordinators who, who deal with, with the county judges and the sheriffs and, and, and stuff. I, I mean, I think it just gets it just gets a little better organized every day. But the truth of the matter is, you know, there are, I mean, there are, when it happens, there are people who don't respond accordingly. And then there will be those who step up and kind of take their place. And I, it's just, it'll be, a, it'll be a huge disaster of epic proportion. It'll probably be the single worst natural disaster in the history of the country. And there are parts of it that will go incredibly well. And there are parts of it that are going to fall apart the minute that, you know, the minute it happens. I mean, it's just, it's the nature of disaster. I have two quick questions. One is, are you looking for people to help on the phones for 1-800-EARTHQUAKE? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure how the call center aspect of that will work. I think that will be a cooperative decision between the health department and, and emergency management. And I think Adam will have a big big play in, in how a call center in works. And, the other question is, we met people, and it was right after 9-11, that had been in Oklahoma, because we happened to be in Oklahoma, and it was right after and they were, had been on the Murrah building team. They still had a group of people, which I thought was a wonderful idea that came from, like you said, fire police, EMTs, workers. We met the guy that was the fence guy, the fence that was around the building. Right. He happened to have a load on his truck. They sent him there. He got assigned to the FBI and was there for several years. But they still, to this day, have a group of people that they pull from each of these different walks to have a counseling thing. Are they doing that for Katrina? <clears throat> there, there's some of that, but I don't think there's a lot of it. I mean, I, you know, I, the response to Katrina was you went there, you did what you could once you were allowed to do it, and then you finished and you went on. I mean, I, I think that's really it. You know, we had people down there until, I guess, right after Thanksgiving, and then they decided they were just going to let the fire department handle that. So there was, there was, you know, any bodies that were recovered after Thanksgiving that year were done by the fire department or what became a remnant of the local coroner's office down there. And so I don't really, I don't, I don't think it's that well organized. Is it, you know, I don't think that, 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 that New Orleans is as organized as they were in Oklahoma after. Because I, I know over there they still use, I mean, they, anytime they have even a tornado, they still roll out a lot of the same people that they rolled out for the, for the bombing. Hi, uh, Arkansas has the dubious uh, distinction of having no designated trauma hospitals in the state. It's the only, only state in the country. How did that enter into your, into your planning, and did it become more of an interstate issue well, to look at you know, the surge? And, sure. The, the hospital, I mean, I, you know, UAMS is still as close as there is to, to level one trauma, and I, I think that eventually they'll get back there. I mean, I think eventually they'll, they'll make the effort to get back to that. I think there's a push within the hospital to get that done. Um, but as, you know, as far as deal, I mean, dealing with surge capacity, the hospital association has, has had a lot of input into our plan. I mean, I, I mean we, we interact with them and, uh, uh, and meet with them rel pretty, pretty often uh, to talk about that. And so I, the, I, the surge capacity part of that for, I mean, not just for the earthquake, but really for, you know, flu pandemic will be the hugest surge capacity statewide for, for the hospital, I mean, without a doubt. Locally, we have, we've, you know, we have agreements with every, just my office have agreements locally with everybody to handle their surge capacity. Um, you know, we're, we, we've got, we have, I guess, whatever you want to call it, agreement, memorandum, understand whatever it is with, with children's to do that. Uh, we're going to provide their surge capacity locally. And then as it, if, if it blooms out statewide, then we'll, under the guise of the, of the rapid response plan, we'll just move into those areas as we're needed. And the hospital association knows and understands that. And, and one of the parts of the, one of the parts of, the, of training the plan is as we go, as we, as we start that after the first of the year is to, since the hospital association is divided up into districts, we'll just we'll hit each district as often as we need to in order to get around to the different hospitals. I've got time for one more question right here. Go ahead. If you would, just talk about how you personally uh, keep yourself centered. Uh, I'm interested spiritually, right. but yeah, when right. you're in the face of a tsunami. Sure, and let me tell you, and, here, and here's, here's the truth. Of that. The truthful answer to that is I got no idea. I, I, I'm telling you the truth. I, here's what I believe. I believe that I believe that I have been given an ability to deal with that that is unlike most any other person that I've ever met. I know of about three or four people in my travels around the world that are similarly situated to me. And I don't understand it. 
I, and listen, that's the only reason I stay. That's the only reason I've been at the coroner's office here 20 years. I mean, I, when I started the coroner's office, I figured it's about a two or three year gig, and I'm moving on to something else. It, I truly, honest to God, I did. And you know, here I am, 21 years later, and I'm still doing the same thing. And I just, I believe that, you know, especially when we try to hire people in, I, I believe that there, I believe that 95 percent of the general population is not my hiring pool. And so, so, but then you, you have to, you know, you have to find. You have to find people that can do it and that can be in it and who can who can move at that speed. And there and I and I truly I mean there's not a lot. I, I just and it's not anything that I that I, I don't understand it, but I accept it. So I do it, which is one of the reasons I think I continue to do it. I mean I you know, we've I mean, we've had opportunities to go and do other things, but I I think that I believe that there is I believe there is value in serving others. I believe that you know, public servants don't get paid a whole lot, so I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not beating the path to the bank every day, and 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 I'm broke just like everybody else. But I think that if I think if you have an ability to serve and you're able to serve, then that's what you should do. I mean, I and and if it means that, you know, if it if it means that you turn away opportunities to maybe financially excel or or I, or build something in that vain I think I, th I think you turn away from that and you stay you stay where you know you're good you stay where you know you can you can help and and I, I mean I just I think that it's I think it's it's, a, it's it's almost a calling I mean I really and truly I mean I, I think if you're called to serve you'll serve and when if you're given an opportunity to do something else you just pass it by and continue to serve so I, the answer to your question is I don't have any idea I just I mean I really don't I you know I get up every day I do the things I do I go home at night and I start again tomorrow and that's just the way I've always done it Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it from Mark Malcolm. Thank you all very much. Give us just a few minutes to move the backdrop so everybody can exit out the front door in the rain. Thanks for coming.